in general often have imaging as a deliverable. And so thinking about how we're going to take pictures of all these things, since it's a time taker, is something that we really need to think about. In terms of working on dig-in, we have a huge variety, right? We heard earlier there's 30 phyla, so there's just a lot of different kinds of things that all have different kinds of needs. So there's no one single solution for creating the best images for in the allotted time. And then on top of that, you know, marine invertebrates, they're wet and some of them are squiggly and squishy and they have a lot of, you know, there are a lot of concerns in terms of how do I best treat this specimen to not do something terrible to it and still be able to take a picture of it. So first of all, I'd suggest to think about something like, what is the purpose of imaging, right? <laughs> One of the main things I think about is like, we can't sit here and ask a brittle star, what's the most important thing about its whole life cycle and how this works out? And what is it like to be a brittle star? So one of the ways that we do this through research is, you know, we use imaging to help out with this. We may be looking at morphology. We may be looking at, we may be interested in specific orientations of the organism. So that's something I have to keep in mind when, when I'm taking images. There may be specific organs of interest to define the, that specific species. Um, you need biological familiarity with what it is. And when you're working with 30 phyla, how do you have familiarity with all of them? <laughs> And on top of that, you know, you have things like you can go back to literature. Literature can really help you do that, do some of those determinations to know what is important to take a picture of. Or, you know, in the case of dealing with an image request, asking people, what are the things that you want to see? Can you show me an example? <laughs> can save me a ton of time as the person doing imaging. But then also, it's, that's not all that there is, right? We really should think of keeping track of images for collections care. So you're able to show your curation choices. If there are jars, if you've changed the types of jars that you used, if there was a jar that might tell you a specific time that was the last time that someone touched this in the collection, that's like a really helpful base of information to provide not only you know, to yourself, but to your staff. Um, it could also help in terms of taking the condition shot of a label as they slowly deteriorate away from you. <laughs> um, Early in my time at the MCZ, I actually had to like write a label because I didn't have phone with a camera at the time um, as it disintegrated, you know, and how much easier it is it to deal with that sort of panic if I have my phone with me and I can be like, there we go. Like, at least I have all of the information that's on that label before it's small pieces. Um, and then also there you're able to document what things look like in storage, which can help for someone trying to look for the thing later. Uh, and also you can take images before and after subsampling. So if you've made any change to the specimen, taking a picture of it beforehand means that you know what it did look like at X date in time. And then bonus uses. Uh, you can also use this stuff for social media. You can also use this stuff for publicity, right? If, if your institution has annual reports, we got pictures. Like there's all sorts of other ways that you can use this material. So I think of it as when we're doing imaging, we might be reactive or we could be proactive. If we're being reactive, generally speaking, this can feel really stressful for the person taking the pictures because you've got deadlines, generally feels a little bit like a burden, right? It part, becomes part of your work requirement of things you gotta do. So for me, right, I'm trying to fulfill our promise for the dig-in grant. Um, I also handle a lot of our imaging requests from researchers who are like, I don't want to get this on loan, but if you could send me a research ready image, that would be really great. Um, so that's another way in which, right, that comes with a sense of a deadline, a sense of like needing to get a thing done on time. Um, and then it's also, you know, we use images for, to ascertain that something is really what's wanted before it's sent out on loan. <laughs> uh, sometimes that's a really great way to just be like, are you sure this is what you want? Because this is the condition it's in right now. Um, but I think that we should be thinking a little bit more proactively about imaging, thinking about that general workflow. Um, and it's really hard when something isn't under a deadline to set the time to do it. Uh, and so that's what's hard. But really, imaging takes skills, and you really need to keep those skills in practice. So spending some time on imaging means that you, the next time you have to take an image, it's not that much of a mind burden. Um, it allows us to extend our specimens. And like, that's always what I have to keep in mind. It's an opportunity to answer research questions or opportunity to answer research questions that haven't been asked yet. And it's a way to ensure, and then on top of that, again, thinking proactively, if you have visitors who are taking pictures of things, get those pictures. 
or also, you know, if you have a donation that's coming in, take quick snapshots of what's been donated to the museum so that you have that as a reference point. Um, and so, you know, for example, here on the, in the images under reactive, we have some of my research images of ophiroids because I'm documenting all our types. And on the other side, on the right side, we have in terms of proactive, this, these are images that a visitor took of some ophiroids when they were visiting and making sure that we get those images up in our database and linked to the specimens, right? Now when I'm imaging types, I don't have to do this one that a researcher did when they were visiting. It saves me time. And then the other idea is just to add imaging steps where possible. Um, so we have a CSBR grant, which is a genetic subsampling grant. And as part of that process, you know, having, having the, the curatorial assistant who is doing that work, uh, Nina Black, who's here, um, having her take snapshots of the specimens as, right, she's taking everything out of its where it lives um, and cutting off a piece of it. And then, so m taking those snapshots at a time is a win because, right, we've at least taken an image of that type at a period in time. Um, and the thing I always just remind people is just make sure you have scale of some sort so you know how big whatever it is is. And, you know, even if you have to write it on a little piece of paper, just write the catalog number so it's in the shot. So that just in case the file doesn't get named in a logical way, you're able to pull, you're able to get that information later and connect it to the specimen. And then the other thing I I always say is like just we all we have all this awesome data and we have all these this awesome media and stuff, but right people make all these things, and so we have to think about what are the ways that we make pe help people to do all this work. So you've got equipment that you've got to choose. So for example, you know we have a copy stand with a digital SLR. We also have uh, on the lower right is um, uh, we have a Keyens microscope at Harvard, but it's a shared resource, right? So I have to consider: is there time open in the calendar for me to go use it? We have like a, a sign a sign up system, an online sign up system. So you know, like around May, around April, graduation time might be a little bit harder to get in there and book some time. Those are things I have to keep in mind in my workflow. Um, but then also, you know, for those resources, for what, for our camera stand set up in the, in the department, it's really helpful to have some sort of resource for anyone that's going to use it, where things are and what they do. So where the camera's mounted, how the lights are mounted, what are the things that you can move around, all that sort of stuff. So you want to give people as much familiarity of the layout area and how it's used. And then the other thing is to go back when people do, when other people use a station that I don't necessarily, that I use. I try to ask them afterwards, how was it? Would it be better to have clear space? Because someone else may say, if you clear off this space on the left, you can put the specimens there and you have a nice little place to like just literally make your own little assembly line. And I wouldn't have thought of that because I will just make things hard for myself. <laughs> the other thing is just making sure that you have enough documentation, what goes where, what cables are needed, where are backups, who has batteries, where are the batteries, are they charged? Do you have a way of designating what's been charged and what's not been charged? Like these are simple, like some of the photography stuff is like simple tasks, but they're really helpful to have done in a better way. And then you need to consider what software you're gonna use. So, right, I like to use Lightroom and Photoshop, and then we have stacking software for stacking, for doing uh, stack, stacked images. Um, you have to know things about specimen handling and posing. You need to know what materials you can use to help you organize and orient your specimen in space. Um, and then on top of that, just thinking of that, you just need to encourage flexibility. So can the person creating images easily determine which technique is the best one to use? Can they determine what sort of props they might need to help them get the task done? Uh, and then the other one is you gotta train people to back stuff up, your archival processes. I think of using a three, two, one plan as much as possible. So you keep three copies of any file. You put them in at least two different kinds of places. So on a hard drive and in a cloud at least. Um, and then one has to be stored offsite, which the cloud helps you with that. Um, so right, we have shared, so we have servers that we use that are internal to Harvard. I use the cloud and then I also have, you know, a backup hard drive aside from the hard drive that my computer is. But on top of that, like if that's going to be your process, you have to think about your staff time, having time to do those backups, which, you know, if you're like, oh, I took like 300 pictures this week. When are you going to sit and back those up? That takes time as someone who has like moved gigs and gigs of data being like, why did I wait till the end of the month? So in general speak, 
speaking about uh, marine invertebrates, you have to consider whether or not you're working with wet specimens or dry specimens. I would say that wet specimens come with a little bit more heavy lifting. You have to choose. Some people like to drain them. Some types of specimens that are fairly hard, like an echinoderm, right? It's pretty fine to pull it out of pull it out of alcohol and take pictures of it dry. Um, but there are others where you may want to actually take a picture of them wet, in which case, you know, make sure that whatever your scale is can be in ethanol and it's safe to be in ethanol and won't cause a problem with anybody. Um, then uh, if you are shooting in liquid, you have to make sure that everything's completely submerged. Do you have containers for that? I always think of in terms of containers, I have different uh, surfaces that I use, like to use for wet and dry specimens. Um, and in terms of wet specimens, think of having containers that suit at least, you know, like 70 to 80% of your things that you could be taking a picture of. Not everything, because some things are like really edge cases. For me, if I want to want to take a picture of something really big, if I need to take a picture of a giant isopod, I'm going to go to the fish department with that because they have big tanks for that. I don't need to have a big tank in my setup. Because um, for the most part, our other departments are, are friendly and it's okay, we can go talk to them. <laughs> um, let me see. And the other thing is also in terms of asking other departments for help, there are other folks like in our institution that have been taking really good pictures of specimens at all different size scales for a very long time. And so there's a lot of expertise in-house that's not necessarily in my own department. So again, you know, I can become good friends with the folks in entomology, the folks working on Big B, right? I can walk over to the fish department and anything I want to know about taking a picture of something in a tank, they've been doing for decades. Um, and so that sort of support becomes really important. You also want to think of options for troubleshooting. Um, this is just a really quick, quick example of a specimen on a, on a stand, on the copy stand, as I would take a picture of it. It's real small. Those are little millimeter hashes. But in terms of labels, learning different tip, tips and tricks, uh, those labels I can't read. Those are the same labels in the top and bottom image. But if I use a black light, all of a sudden that ink that just seems too old and faded and gone suddenly pops up. And so at least, you know, for the moment, I can like capture that locality data that was totally unreadable before. So I already talked about thinking about other collections in your institution, talking to people for advice, but also consider your colleagues at other institutions. One of the best parts about being in a TCN is that I have friends in many places that all have also tried to do all of these things and we all have ideas and it's great. And I mean, that's also what I think about this conference as being for. And then on, on top of that, I would say always remember that NH call exists. You can always send out an email. It's pretty great to hear people's different feedback. And then I've listed out a number of, of talks and resources here that I really like. Um, Paul Kalman has both a long form talk that's like an hour and a paper that's, um, it's both on ResearchGate and it's on iDigBio um, about imaging, mostly it deals with mollusks, but uh, invertebrates in general. Uh, Austin Mass talk at, at BioDigicon is really, really good. It's just hard to track down. So <laughs> I have a link in here. Um, I'll sh in the next slide, I have my, my digital card. If you send me a note, I will send you all of these links if you would like. But the other thing is to consider other people who take good pictures of things. So artifact photography, people work really hard to have very neutral, neutral, beautiful photos of artifacts. Um, so there's a really good walkthrough that is where I learned all of my lighting tricks for a specimen um, through this, this basic taking a picture of a cuneiform uh, example, little piece of tablet. Also, the cultural sector also has lots of advice at lots of different price points for taking pictures of, of objects in a collection. Um, so that's that bottom, bottom right example is looking at image-based and 3D-based approaches for photographing specimens. Um, but they're looking at things like dresses and handbags and, you know, like different things that you would find in any other kind of museum collection. But they're the same things, right? It doesn't matter that what we have is, you know, shells and starfish and isopods. Like it's this, it's very, photo, photography is photography. Um, and then the other one is uh, the AIC Guide to Digital Photography, which is a, a very well worth the $24 PDF that I picked up. Um, and I will leave my information on up there for you. Thank you very much for your time. Thank you very much for hanging out at this symposium. Where are we time-wise? I think, yeah, we're good. Great. So last up before our break, 
in this chunk of the symposium, we have Muriel coming up from AMNH. And so we heard a little bit about bryozoans earlier, but now you get to see a lot more about bryozoans. 